A very good morning to you. It is a Monday morning, October the 10th, 101094. Welcome. This is Impact on KLOS. My name is, is Frank Sontag. Impact is the in-studio guest format where we discuss a wide variety of topics. Tonight I do have an in-studio guest who I have not met in person before, but I have followed John Trudell's work and commitment to, in my experience, making it a better world at the very least for a long time. And I do have John in studio across from me. And, John, I want to welcome you to Impact this morning. Well, glad to be here, Matt. <laughs> uh, so you're a late nighter. You said you like the night, huh? I'm a slave to the night. Are you? Yeah. No, I, no, I, I like the night world. Yeah. Right. We are slaves. A lot of us are slaves to other things as well. Everybody's a slave. What do you mean? The society is enslaved by an economic system. Right? And illusions of values and things like that. So I just think that, you know, in, in, in the technologic society, that basically it operates on the enslavement of the energies of the human beings or the people. Do most people stop to think about those things? I mean, we were told, I know me growing up, you know, this American dream. Work hard and someday you'll have that house and that car. Do most people, you think, perceive themselves as being slaves to the system? No. Uh, because if most people are distracted by their insecurities and... Uh, this rapidly increasing fear of uh, fear of survival and how they're going to survive <laughs> economically, health-wise, all these types of things. So, so no, they don't relate to <laughs> themselves as being enslaved because there's so many so many problems there <laughs> that have to be dealt with. They don't really have time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Off the air, I had mentioned to you that I'm struggling, and you said, in a sense, we are all struggling. What is the struggle about for you? <laughs> uh, wow. Well, I, I, kind of general, it's like to do more good than bad while I'm here, <laughs> right? Or at least keep it even, but not to damage the world by my presence. And uh, to me, that's what it, how I relate to it. Mm -hmm. To those that don't know who you are or any of your work, uh, you, you educated me a couple of weeks ago at a talk because I automatically still, even though I don't want to admit it, I still label people. I see indigenous cultures sometimes, I call them Native Americans. And you said, I'm not a Native American. Not to me directly, but in your talk. Who, who is John Trudell? <laughs> Depends on what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> How about Sunday night at midnight, man? How about right now? <laughs> oh, yeah. How about right now? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if I can tell you that. Um, but let's go after this Native American thing. Okay. All right. Uh, this is, I think, is this Columbus Day or some nonsense? Well, it, it's sometime soon, I'm sure. Yeah. It seems to me we're in the middle of October. But it's this whole idea of Native Americans. Um, because when Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere, there were people here. And these people that lived here, basically, uh, there were many cultures and many languages. But they were the people of this land base. And almost universally within this concept, they always referred to themselves in their own languages or cultures as the people, the human beings, but that was always a part of the of the self identification, the identification of self, the people. And the Europeans came and they refused to recognize us as the people. They called us Indians. And to me that was a very that was a very essential part of the genocide. It was just as much as the diseased blankets or the you know uh the diseased Bibles, the guns, I mean, just the whole, this whole insane idea about the conquest. Uh, so they never recognized us as the people. We became this abstraction of Indians. See, whereas the people, the people, the people have a continuity that goes way back into the ancient times. 
See, Indians only have an identity going back to the arrival of the European. And, and it's, an, it's an identity of genocide. Uh, and so it's like, it's like a severing of a memory <laughs> or an essence that flows beyond time. It's part of our ancestry, what our DNA things are really about. But so anyway, we have 200 or 400 or a million years of that that happened to us. And then within, within my lifetime, when we were struggling <laughs> to survive, let's say, uh, and we were known as the militants or the activists or whatever, um, the new terminology became Native American. So they didn't change <laughs> the genocidal attitudes, consciousnesses, or unconsciousness behaviors against us. They changed our name. And it's like, but we're not native to America because we are older than America. See, in America, so we cannot be Native American because we are older than it. It is just a temporary name. It is a name that was created in these languages and these thoughts and these concepts and, and of cultures that are alien to this land. It does not s spring from this land, you know, and our DNA is connected to our land bases. And I mean, many, well, anyway, so, but we're not Native Americans. We're the people. And, and I, I, my feeling is that, you know, this is, it's like, it's an essential part of genocide to erase the memory, the memories of the people, those, I mean, it is a part of genocide. You know, it's a, you know, it's a sophisticated part of genocide because if you're, if you're busy erasing their minds, the society at large will accept any form of physical hardship you put them through as long as they can physically know that they're there. <laughs> whether they're suffering or not, but physically they're still there. So, but it's that other genocide that is the, the more deadly effect of assimilation as genocide is that where they start to er just erase our whole conscious connection to who we are. And it's, it's an ongoing thing. See? So, and um, I, I don't think that it's healthy for us. You know, it just shows me, well, we still are in a situation where the Americans refuse to recognize who we are. They still don't see us. Do you think the Americans, as it were, know who they are? <coughs> Understand where they come from? Understand their purpose here? No, they don't have a clue. They're, they're, I mean, not to misunderstand, but the American people... The Americans, they are the descendants of tribes also. See, they have a tribal ancestry. And it's back, it's in the genetic memories, and it's, it's way back. I mean, it goes through time. But we are all the descendants of tribes. Uh, I think that when I look around America, that memory isn't there. It's just not there. So that's why I say they don't really know who they are. It's not that they can't find out or cannot bring... Or it's not that consciousness can't be brought back, things, but at, at, at this point, just the way that things are. No, you know, it's like... Um, it's about... Let's look at the past. We live in a society that does not follow the teachings of its past, its commandments or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> right? But it's, it's religious moral values, all right? I don't ne necessarily agree that that's really what it's all about. I think it's about responsibility. But we live in a technologic society that follows a dominator male god, and they say that they, they speak that they follow a religious moral value. But we live in a society that does not follow that religious moral value about coveting and stealing and killing and, you know, all the stuff. The worship of false idols and things like that, you know. I mean, it's the society listens to none of those teachings. So, so I see that to me it's like they don't feel any sense of spiritual relationship, continuity. 
to their own ancestry, their ancestral past. And at the, and at the, the, the state of mental confusion that exists that's called norm, normalcy, all right, they are tolerating a situation in life where they continually and perpetually feel powerless. And because they tolerate and perpetuate that situation, they are, dis they are spiritually dis disconnecting themselves from their, their descendants, from their future. Because there are, there are uh, the environment is continuing to be attacked, the life support systems of the planet. Uh, those who, the, the systems of authority that call themselves government and business, they, they are entrenching uh, this wage slave <laughs> system by, it's, I mean, it's inflation and recession and tr trillion dollar national debts and things. But see, what it is in the end is it's a form of, of, of an economic enslavement of our children and their children and their children. See? So it's like we live in a contemporary society that doesn't know who it is. <laughs> you know, they just don't know who they are. And this situation has become created. And, and would you also say that this modern day society not only doesn't know who it is, but has virtually no understanding of power and its connection to power and what power is? Yeah, the con <coughs> very nicely put. <laughs> uh, I think we live in a we live in a time where the society relates to authority as power, and basically has no real understanding of power. All right, uh, fine lines now. <laughs> we're we're going to. All these fine lines. There's the reality and the illusion, right? Uh, like there's the human and the being, and there's all. But we live in it. We live in a time where, through technologic progress and the whole concept of technologic, our consciousness has been, our conscious memories get erased of what is true and real about our ancestral past, and new memories get inbred through the generations, through the programming to meet the definition of technologic submission, all right, because that's what tech, that's in the end what it is. And, and so everything gets defined for us. See, so we, we, and we're well into, uh, into the technologic Reich. We're, it's well on, so we're well into it right now. And so by this stage of our human evolution, here we are surrounded by this tech, but anyway, this technologic right and its definition. And it has defined for us that power is um, authority. See, because whether it's money, whether you accumulate all the money, that's authority. That's really about authority. If you, if you accumulate the military, that's really about authority. It's not about power. It's about authority. All right? It's to have dominated religions. It's not about power. It's about authority. But this, these systems of authority, now where power comes into play is we all have human consciousness and energy, essence, spirit. So these systems of authority mine our human energies, consciousness, essence, spirit as a, as a power, <laughs> turn it into a power to run their authority systems which we always remain subservient to. Because if we look at, well, if money's what makes power and I don't have any money, well, then guess where that makes me, right? Or if whoever has the biggest gun is the most powerful and I don't have it, then guess what that makes me. So, and it, so we all get put in a situation where we're looking at we have no power whatsoever because but we're con we, we have been lied to. They have authority. See, and that's what it is. Power is something else. Actually, they have authority and they maintain authority through violence and deceit because in some way because of their own lack of power. Well, what is power then? If we're all, in a sense, led to believe we want it, it's all about having power. And what really is power? Well, power, we could go off into many, we, we could chase abstractions here, right? Uh, I don't know. 
I think that power has to do human being, human physical being, spirit, human being, human being, physical spirit. And I think that power is in there in relationship to the human beings. Power is in the clarity that is in that physical spirit, the coherency that is in that that is in that physical spirit. Is that also where self respect lies? It's about well, let's say yes it is about self respect. It's about recognition of self is really what it is. It's about recognition of self. See, but we've been mined by these technologic authority systems in ways becoming like dissected by race, culture, class, all right, and all the other little things that we get and then dissected inside of our own heads with all the little the insecurities and the self doubts and the guilts and the blames and all of this and that. See, so there we have no coherency, no clarity as physical spirits. And this is and this has to be for us as human human beings where power really is because serious the the authoritarians have went to great extremes tremendous extremes to keep us incoherent as physical spirits see so that it has to be it's like i learned from the political just from the political days that about being spied upon, someone come to tell on you, or what is said in meetings or in public gatherings. See, and, and it made me understand, well, look, they have all the power, so to speak, authority, so what do they care what anybody says? See, so that means, it's not, they, so that means power is something here that we're not really, really looking at. But if they had it, why would they worry about what you were doing? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I would think. Authority's always on shaky ground. Authority tends to build itself on keeping people separated and powerless, and, and it's almost as if we're at war with each other. Well, well I mean, it's, it's been... To me, it's been re brought down to the point of where at war with one another, at war with ourselves inside of our own heads. See, and, and now about, about the illusion and the reality. See, to me, this is all a part of the illusion. <laughs> the reality is it's about responsibility. See, we are responsible. Physical spirit, human being. So we are responsible as physical spirits, as human beings. We are responsible to life. <laughs> See, that's what it is. But we live in these authority systems of power that tell us and condition us to blame. They condition us with guilt, sin, and blame. See? And, and with that conditioning, then you're always the blamer. See, it's never your response. It's never one's responsibility. You carry the guilt, carry it all. See, but in the end, see that it can't, even that whole concept is like to feel guilty, to live a, to live lives dominated. Because see, I mean, what always threw me off is that we're guilty for being here. The moment we're born. Yeah, see, <laughs> that's insane. You know. Uh, but once we, again, their definition, but once we go by that technologic definition, then, see, then already our recognition of self is being attacked. And, and it conditions us to not take responsibility. It conditions us to blame, very minimally blame ourselves or someone else. But it, but it, it does not teach us about responsibility. See, because if you feel even about guilt, see, we have to blame ourselves. See, and it's not about that. It's about responsibility and learning from the things that we go through. But it's about responsibility. So this might be the, the next logical question and probably a lot harder to answer, but 
where does one go or how does one take up the search to find what is real or is reality? You find your own reality, man. <laughs> you got a mind. You know, you have creative. We all have creative. We are all, we are all creative. <laughs> it's just that we use too much of our creative process or creative ability irresponsibly. We use it on a daily basis to create again what our insecurity and our fears are. And I think that if we make conscious effort to spend part of that time using our creative ability differently, the same way we would learn to do anything, <laughs> so we have to tell our mind to do this, right? But start to use that creative part of us in a different way. Um, and we should We should, we should never lie to ourselves, never, about who we are, what we're capable of. We should never lie to ourselves. We should always tell ourselves the truth, even if we don't like those truths. But we should always tell ourselves the truth. Because we, if we don't do that, how can we define our own basis of reality? And, and I think that it, we just head off, you know. One of the things that seems to be so predominant right now is this other concept I just want to ask you to talk about for a minute. And then there's some other things I want to maybe talk about here. And in a little while, we'll open the phone lines. I'm sure some of our listeners maybe would like to have some questions or comments for you. Fear, John. I do interviews every week with different types of guests, anywhere from psychologists to healers, to business people, to environmentalists, to, to experts on the criminal justice system. And fear always comes up in the interview that right now the world as we buy into or the world exists is so fear-filled. That's because the people in that world don't know who they are. Their spirit is being eaten upon. Their collective individual, their individual collective spirit is being fed upon. It is the energy that runs the authoritarian system. So they have, no, they, they don't, some of them are more obedient than others and more well behaved than others and have their respectabilities and irres, irrespectabilities in the different stratas of the society. But generally speaking, you know, the society at large is not happy with itself. It's the fear. I mean, the system is run on fear. Think about the guilt, sin, and blame. Fear. It's run on. I mean, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta fear your God. You gotta fear your Lucifer. <laughs> so what's the difference? <laughs> right? And it's fear. Fear see, fear is a natural human feeling and it's and it's not a uh, frivolous feeling, so it's I mean but there's a time but there also becomes a point when it's no longer fear and it's just mass paranoia. <laughs> And it's not really fear. Fear is when your heart jumps right in your throat because you just it just does. Fear is when it just spins and turns inside of you and your blood is running into itself. Fear is something that's very, very real. That's fear. I mean, there is fear. But then there is this collective paranoia, and that's what I think it is more than it is fear. But it's, it's, it has a nice, convenient little term. But there's this collective paranoia. Let's go back to the tribes. The people of America, they are the children of the tribes of Europe. And when they were still the tribes of Europe, they worshipped the earth as the mother and had an entirely different perception of reality. And that perception was to keep the harmony and the balance as much as possible. And somewhere historically, historically in time, there appeared 
the dominator theory of God. And this, this dominator theory of God is that God was a male and everything was subservient. And this theory was used its technology and its culture to make weapons of destruction, to improve the weapons of killing. The tribes then had this imposed upon them through fear. So, I mean, you know, this isn't that... Well, anyway, this is, and, and, as the tribes were broken down through the various faces of the technologic civilizations, whether it was through the Romans or whoever, it was as that, that was all evolving. The tribes were attacked and made to give up the ways of the earth and submit to the new God. Now, this happened to the Europeans before it happened to us. But what happened to us happened to the European children of the tribes also. But it happened maybe 800 years before it happened to us. And actually, in its own form and at particular time within civilization, when, when the Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere, Europe was going through the Inquisition. And the Inquisition was basically the church establishing authority over the, the people of the earth establishing authority. And they had like 500 years of Inquisition. And in, 500, see, and, and in the Inquisition, and women were special targets because they were trying to erase that tribal memory of the earth as the mother and things. But the deal was that if you were accused of speaking against the church, you were automatically guilty. And they had to torture you. And you had to tell them all the names you could give them. And you would because of the, of the ways that they tortured. And, and they seized all your property. 500 years of this. Because prior to that, the people were coexisting in some manner of fashion with the religious authorities, see, but they were still praying to their own. <laughs> you know, they were still closer to their tribal ancestry. So by the time Columbus got here, it was like it was like a virus now within the within the human being, the physical spirit. And it's like it's now entering into the DNA, almost into the memory, the genetic. So the citizens have been afraid for a long time. <laughs> They've been afraid. They've nothing but fear for so long, longer than us as the people here. Because our, con our encounter with this whole perception of reality is 500 years, you know, rather than 3,000. One of the things that recently, in modern times, if you will, has changed our reality, and I don't think this can be debated, is a square box with a visual image, a television, and the way in which, I, 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 you know, uh, what are your thoughts on television, John? I, I don't think that it has changed our, I don't think that it has changed our reality. I think that the overall advances in tech, what they call, yes, the overall advances in technology have changed our reality, and television is only one of those things. Because it seems to be that, that you know, when you go back to Europe in the Middle Ages and they had the fiefdoms and the serfdoms and kept everybody basically ignorant as to what was really going on, so it hasn't changed. <laughs> Yeah. You know, television didn't come along and change it all of a sudden turn everyone ignorant to what was actually going on they didn't know you know see so I mean uh, television is not uh, it's not used generally speaking it's not used in the healthiest best ways in, let's put it this way it's not used in responsible ways Right. But I think that it's just one of, I mean, because you get down to it, faxes, a fax, trying to save the forest, right? And everybody faxes everything everywhere just to play sometimes. The paper has come from somewhere. So, I mean, you know, so to me, it all becomes, 
relative, well, his TV or the, <laughs> he ever uses the fact, you know. So I, it's, it, to me, it's the collective advancement of this technologic mindset without any sense of responsibility. And so the television, the movies did it, the radio, right? It's like, uh, if I, and what has been the television, see the one thing about TV, now let's, because we know they will never use it responsibly. But you look within our generation, it helped to spread a global consciousness, all right, in spite of whatever the negatives of it are, of any form of the mass communication stuff. It helped to spread a global consciousness amongst human beings, <laughs> all right, that had not really had that consciousness before. Did not really have that understanding about well, a whole lot of us like this. It helped to elevate the global consciousness in the technologic world of sexism and environment. See, and if there had not been this television and these things within our, our generation, we would not have raised that consciousness. See, and, and when we look at the evolutionary continuation, all right, the authoritarians and their way, and the need to, and the way of the earth and the need to live, <laughs> to these two ways. Uh, I think that the very fact that within our generation, the consciousness of sexism and environment was raised to the level that it's been raised, it won't go away voluntarily. All right? The women will not, they will not just turn around and walk away from it. And the, people, the, and the environmental awakening, these people are not going to turn around and walk away from it either. But the authoritarians with their economic systems and all the things that they're creating now, there has to be, at some point, these things must meet. <laughs> all right? And, all right? And so whatever happened is that was brought about. That, that, that's an accomplishment within our generation. And see, and I find it very interesting that the main accomplishment within our generation, to me, was raising that consciousness of environment and earth. Because it's almost like tapping into that unconscious genetic memory linkage, that putting it back together. See, so we have accomplished that within our lifetime of raising it. And, and it's how we keep headed and keep going. And because it's in a, it's through an evolutionary thing. And television, uh, and in my experience with America as a tribal person, the television hasn't done anything the rest of their <laughs> institutions haven't done in regard to me, whether it was their dime novels or whether it was their Wild West shows or whether it was their Hollywood grade B movies or whatever, television is, see, to me, it's just the same old it's business as usual. And, uh, so anyway, it's just, to me, it's just there. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, actually, if I, when I want to erase my... When I want to erase my brain, I watch TV. <laughs> <I do. laughs> it doesn't really erase it, but but it does, you know. Absolutely. In a way. The voice you're listening to is that of John Trudell. If you don't know who John is, in in my estimation, amongst many things, he's a poet. And and uh, I played something from an album that's probably a good ten years old, early on. Tribal Voice was what about I don't know. Well, eight years. This is nineteen. This is ninety four. Yeah, actually, I think we recorded that about 12 years ago. Mm. I'm just a little curious. Let's let's get into that. Uh, you've had a number of albums, a number, you know, that that have come out over the years. Have you always had this ability to? Uh, how can I put it into words? See, I hear you being able to formulate thoughts and feelings and emotions into words that speak of such truth. And that's poetry to me, amongst other things. Have you always had that? Well, I don't know. Uh, no, I can't say that. I'll put it this way. I've always had my moments of coherency. <laughs> All right? Uh, but the older I get, what I have learned is that there's a moment of equal incoherency that I gotta deal with, right? See, so it may look good, sound good, but sometimes it's rough, man. I gotcha. 
I got gotcha. you. <laughs> How did this happen? How did this start? How did you start putting it to music? When when did all this occur? Uh, well, I started writing in '79, and and I was uh. I met Jackson, Jackson Brown, and Bonnie Raitt, and I met them in '79, and I and I started writing in '79. And anyway, I kind of entered into Jackson's world. And so basically, meaning that I was around recording studios, and I had no purpose. I was just there, I and mean, had had accessibility, and it was as good a place to be as any at the time. So I was around, you know, different, I was just around the environment, and I had started writing. And, but see, I'm not a musician, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know a note from a letter, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at some point by 1980, I think it was the spring of 82, it seems to me, that I, I wanted to try and take what I was writing, the spoken word lines, uh, because I'm not a musician and I, I don't sing. I'm not a singer. So I was going to have to. It was just, in a way, like a compulsion. This is something I, I, I had to do it, right? So obviously, because I did it, right? And um, but it was to take the spoken word and put it with music. So I, the first effort at that was a, a, a uh, tape called Tribal Voice and we recorded that at Jackson's studio when he, he had a studio in downtown LA and we recorded that over a weekend I think or something and over a couple of days right and, then, uh, and so in, in some ways yeah Jackson helped or he produced it basically I think right but so Tribal Voice was and when we made Tribal Voice what I wanted to do was I wanted to take uh in a way, it's got to do with energy, right? I mean, for terminology, I'm going to say energy. And I wanted to take and see what we could do with the voices, through the chants and the harmonies, through the spoken word, through the use of the drum, and through what the spoken word was saying, the thoughts. So I, I, I was looking in terms of these four natural elements and what can we make with these four natural forms of energy or spirit and can we make something with that that, that would have a life when you feed it into the recording, the technological system. See, it would have its own life when it went in so I, we know it would have a life. We weren't using the technological system to create the spirit, just, <laughs> right? So that was what it was all about. And I wanted to try that, and, and I also wanted to try it with electric music. But at that time, uh, I was, we made the tribal voice tape with the traditional music, and uh, it took two years before I met Jesse Ed Davis, and then when I met Jesse Ed, I had the opportunity to make a, a, a tape we called AKA Graffiti Man, where I took, then took the spoken word and put it with electric music. And, and I wanted to do that. I went from tribal voice to graffiti man because I, I didn't want, and again, but this time it was still using the same, in my mind, formula about the spirit and this energy. Can we, right? And, uh, but now we were using the technology in a little bit different way because we were using all these electric instruments and that looked the language of music, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Western music. Uh, but to see if we could mix these and see what kind of an energy, a life. And um, so we ended up, Jesse and, and, and uh, Rick Eckstein and myself, we, we made a uh, tape called AKA Graffiti Man. And... Um, just kind of, and I've made more tapes, right? Uh, the record business wouldn't deal with me. Uh, and so we put them out ourselves on a, our own label, the Peace Company, 
We, I mean, I was never real good at distribution, but but we got some of them out there. And they, I want to sell all of these records right, so, with some I mean, purpose. There was much conscious effort to do what I was doing, but yes, but it was, yeah. And, uh, and I've been... Uh, and it, so we, uh, we, and this was 1985, we recorded this Graffiti Man tape, Jesse, and, um, and then in 86 he put a band together. And that was when I, my first time ever working with a band on stage. I mean, see, I mean, I was, I was walking into this one cold. Because I, I mean, I, I could, I had done things from the stage as a speaker, but that's just me. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all of a sudden... I'm here with these people, and I got I got to fit into their synchronicity because they're speaking this language of music. That's, right? I mean, I can feel it, but I mean, but I'm not a technician at it, though. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, uh, but it's all right. I liked it, you know, and so I'm still doing it the best that I can. Recently, the most uh, the newest album is Johnny Damas and Me. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. What's that album about? <laughs> uh, how could I even begin to tell you that? It's a, what I would suggest is... Uh, it's... <laughs> I don't know. Do you like the way it turned out? Well, I'm very happy with it. Are you? Yes, I am. I'm very happy with it. And, and it's about... See, I mean, Johnny Damas and me... Uh, is the title song, right? I mean, it's a song as well as a, but, um And I think the whole album is about what Johnny Damas and me is about, <laughs> right? And, and that particular song is about how we deal with situations. Do you have one cut in particular that stands out as something that, I don't know, something come to mind? That you like. I mean, I've got the CD in my hand. What I was thinking is maybe I'll play something off it. We'll take care of a little bit of commercial business, and then uh, we'll go from there. Shadow over Sister Line. Okay, that's the fourth one. Let me throw that out in the machine. Mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit about this and, and what the, what the title is about and what the song represents. <laughs> or, or well, what or I will tell you. What, or, no, what I will tell you about it is that. Uh, from the time I knew that I was going to make this album called Johnny Damas and Me, I knew I was gonna, there was going to be this song on there called Shadow Over Sister Land. It was the hardest song for me to get. It was the very last song I got. Right? I wrote two other songs trying to get Shadow. Uh, and that's what I'll tell you about it. <laughs> you know, I always knew it was going to be there, but it was a hard one for me to get. And here it is. And we'll be back. This is KLOS. go out of the way on my end, I'm humbled by the fact that I can rest assured, John, that you've never been played on the station before other than on my show. And and <laughs> maybe we'll go up to the hall and talk to the boss and say, hey, boss, you know, we need something to spark the station because, uh, frankly, our ratings suck these days. What do you think? Well, they ought to use more spoken word music and music formats. Yeah. yeah. Start looking around for some of this. Have you heard Robbie Robertson's new one? Yes. What do you think of it? Do you like it? <laughs> Well, here. <laughs> you have to ask me this. <laughs> Don't have to answer it. No, I understand it. No. Um, um, Just wondering. I, 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 no, for what it is, I do like it, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, but see, like we were discussing a little earlier in the program, see, I have a problem with the, I, I have a problem with the idea of perpetuating this Native American imagery. Mm -hmm. Right? And so... And, and my feeling is, is that, well, if there's anything missing in this album, it's because it's been approached from the Native American experience and not the experience of the people. So that will, that will affect the energies that 
become a part of the overall thing, if that makes any sense. And that's loud and clear. So that's what to me. I perceive off of it. But but I like it. It's a good album, mm. right? Uh, but I think that uh, there could have been more, I think. Mm. Let me give out the numbers here. Because we do have a few folks that have already called and are talking to Tammy in the other room, and I haven't even given out the numbers. So it is a little after 1 o'clock. This is KLOS Los Angeles. And if you'd like to be on this morning on Impact, my in-studio guest, John Trudell, you can call at any of the following numbers. If you have any questions or comments for, gosh, eight years, and uh, this is just really, I'm really appreciative to be in this position right now. We've got a lot of callers here already that want to talk to you, John. Before we do that, I want to ask you a question. And, and just to clarify the answer, I guess, on the air, I have mentioned recently that you have a book out. There's a book out called Stickman. Yes. That I got a couple of weeks ago at the Midnight Special in Santa Monica. Um, they had some. And uh, me, you know, I get on the air Sunday morning and Sunday night. I'm talking all about your book. And then I'm getting inundated with phone calls at my project saying, Hey, man, where can I get this book? I've called everywhere. No one seems to know anything about it. And I asked you off the air, and you said that, that basically it's going to be there sooner or later. And you're It'll not... be somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> right, here's, here's what I know about the book. Right. All right. Uh, it's called Stick Man. Uh, it's uh, in and out Press is the publisher. And I did a book signing for it two or three or four months or weeks ago at the um, Midnight Special. And, but I'm not sure if what I did there at the midnight special was really meant the book was released because it seems like somewhere in the back of my mind there's this notion that it's going to be released in October. Mm. All right. So all I really know is it's out there somewhere. Okay. You, do you like the book? Do you like the way it turned out? Yeah. There's some typos in it that I <laughs> <laughs> kind of drive me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> hey, typos bother you, huh? I do a newsletter. But, uh, same thing. But, you know, reality is reality, yeah. right? True. So I, other than that, I'm, no, I think it's all right. It's called Stickman Poems, Lyrics, Talks, a Conversation. And is it Paola? Yes. Igliori. Yes. She's the woman that helped put this book together. Is that correct? Yeah, actually, yes. essentially, she did put it together. She did put it together. <laughs> right. How did you meet Paola? Who's this woman? Uh, oh, man, I don't remember. Uh, through my manager. Mm. Right. She... Uh, the best, it seemed like this was maybe two or three years ago, maybe a couple of years ago. I think that uh, she had talked with my manager, and he had said something to me about her being interested in doing some kind of a book project. And maybe about a year later, I got back in touch with her. And uh, we just kind of agreed to do this, you know, just to put something, yeah. So I think there's like a limited, I mean, like, you know, there were 4,000, 4, 5,000 of these things run off first time around. But it was... I'll tell you, my experience, as I told you off the air with Tribal Voice, mm -hmm. that there was something in me that was drawn to, it was almost as if, and to me that's evidence of the Spirit on some level, it was almost as if someone was opening my hands to the book and having me go to it and read and I would go oh yeah oh yeah there's a there's a talk in here you did uh 80 I think it was South Dakota uh, uh a survival meeting yeah Black Hill Survival Gathering yeah actually yeah and uh I mean in all honesty I did a speech a couple of weeks ago and I read from your book in part from that that just there is a lot of uh Important elements of truth that, that, that I think people need to be introduced to. And, and whether they make the decision for themselves, works for me, doesn't work for me, it sure beats the old grind of disempowerment, uh, confusion, all of the things that, that, that we find ourselves in is in what's called reality. This world of appearances is the yes. way I call it. So I appreciate the book and your work, man. Well, any parts that are coherent to anyone else, you know. I appreciate that, too. <laughs> <I'll tell> you, <laughs> <that>. <laughs> you want to take some calls? Sure. Okay. Michael, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS. Uh, actually, it's Walter. Oh, um, hang on, Walter. Hang on, hang on. Where'd Michael go? Tam, we lost Michael. So if we get him back, let me know what line he's on. No, he's not. <laughs> Mark, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS. 
Uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, John, the uh, first thing I heard from you was in uh, Denver, Colorado, and I was really impressed, and I was like, who is this guy? And they said, well, that's uh, John Trudell. And then later on, I heard the album, and I was really impressed with your voice and, the, you know, the fact that you're a native person. And uh, what I wanted to say was um, in this, you know, situation that we're in today where words are used to describe people, and there's this wall that's preventing certain voices and certain issues from coming out. How can we break through that wall and, you know, let some of the stuff that needs to be heard? People like you and Christos are doing some incredible stuff, poetry. But what other what other avenues can we can we use, you know, to break through that? Well, I mean, the only way that I know is to do the best that I can, you know, with the best that I got, and just stay after it. Because I, I just think that more and more we have to start speaking our truths. You know, we need to start expressing our feelings. And and that will, because I think the more of us that will do that, will we'll recognize our truths and express them. We'll recognize our feelings and express them. The more of us that will do that, I think we then start to create the way to get around that wall. But as far as, you know, any specific strategy, well, that's up on an individual, I guess, you know, just individually, it, we have to figure out what we would do ourselves. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks for the call this morning, Mark. All right. I think we've got Michael back. Let's try it again. Michael, are you with us? Yes. Good morning. There he is. I hit the wrong button. My apologies. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I was wondering what... Uh you thought about the, the literal fact that that wall, maybe that wall's underneath us, that when we go day to day wearing rubber soled shoes and on cement and nylon carpeting and in cars with rubber wheels, we, are we not ungrounding ourselves and, and literally separating our, our, our spirit self from um, what it already has always been you know, not separate from? Well, no, I think, well, maybe in some kind of ways, but actually... When we look at it, see all of these things that we walk upon, in some way, in the end, they're made from elements of the earth. Okay. Which is that their forms have been changed, but they are basically elements yeah, of the earth. Yeah, I understand. Uh, that, I think that where uh, the, real, the real concern about being disconnecting our spirit is, is about, about the lies that we tell ourselves and the illusions that we, we continue to perpetuate about the way of life that, it, you know, I think that, I think that that's what's more disconnecting. I, I understand exactly what you mean. that's on that level. That's absolutely true and simply true. But I mean, just also the actual, you know, being that we, our bodies function on electromagnetic rate, uh, pulse, pulse rate going up and down our spine and to our brain and to our toes. If we are constantly on, you know, compared to walking on, in moccasins or barefooted where you're, you know, you really feel the, the earth under your feet like animals that can uh, know an earthquake's coming long before it gets there because they're so actually touching the ground. And this is like the first generation or first major generation that's disconnected itself physically, ungrounding itself from the, the earth, literally. I mean, if after so many days of your life, you haven't, uh, your feet haven't touched the ground because rubber and things like that do uh, insulate. They don't, uh, make, we don't make contact with the earth itself. And I just thought about, I don't know, something to think about. Yeah, it uh, is. <laughs> it is, you know. Uh, <laughs> It could be right under our noses and not even know. That but, would be really something. But, well, let's see. But we have to chase this one for a minute. It's like, but when you look at the behavior of the society over the last 500 years or thousand thousand years, this, the oppressor society, the people, something got disconnected before everyone started wearing rubber soles. Something got disconnected, all right, before all this concrete, uh, because that's what ended up that this is the result of that disconnection see so it, it, it's got to do i mean i understand what you're saying about the way our but um it was kind of like my question about television yes that my initial experience is it's the tube that's doing it but even though it isn't part this goes back a lot farther back the yes. car tires i mean it's the same thing back a couple hundred years ago when cars weren't even around. Yes. Michael, I thank you for the call this morning. Brenda, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS with John Trudell. Hi, good morning. Um, John, I'd like to say that um, this is the first time I've heard you speak. Uh, 
I was very impressed with what you said in the sense that um, your message was very clear. Um, so very glad to hear it. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm wondering if um, your, your style of music um, has another forum, be it, uh, you know, diff Kalos is great, but there's a lot of people that, you know, listen to other uh, types of music, and I wonder if that, you know, carries over because it's so universal, you know, it's just, it has to be because we all are responsible, and it just, it's that simple, you know, it, it all makes sense, and it just, it just seems like it needs to uh, carry over into many different avenues or types of, you know, different styles of music, and it's just great. I'm just wondering, if, you know, if it's strictly or, you know, categorized at all. I hope not, but I don't know. There's just a lot of different. Let me let me jump in here. I don't know if you have a response, but I think I do, Brenda. Mm -hmm. uh, John's music is. I mean, I just played it on KLOS. This isn't part of the format. This music, to me, is uh, uh, a, a lot of people uh, know of this. It's not necessarily a radio broadcast extravaganza. I mean, I, I'm sure. Um, let me let me pull her down and ask you. Uh, your stuff hasn't really gotten major airplay at radio stations. Well, <laughs> the radio. <is>, uh, <coughs> Yeah, the radio stations, they they don't want to play me. <laughs> you know? you know? uh, it's, uh, but actually, I think it's a boardroom decision, and I don't think that it's necessarily the on-the-air people's decisions. You know, I mean, I don't know how much the on-the-air people have, how much say they have in what gets played, all right? But but it's like when I first started trying trying to, when Jesse was alive and we had made these first album, Graffiti Man, we took it around uh, because Jesse was known in the music industry, and we took it many places. And at the street level or on the one-on-one -on -one level, many A and R people, many many people liked this album, all right. And uh, but when it would get to the boardroom, to the business room, see, then somewhere, for whatever reasons, they don't see it or don't want to see it or whatever it is. And I think you know, to some degree, this still happens, you know, um, in commercial radio. Radios, you know, you know, but see, but this is, you know, this is where radio, television, in, in many ways, they're all the same. I mean, you know, it's because you get programmed what, what the bosses want you to see, you know, and to understand the reality that we're up against anyway, the, the political rebellion that came out of the late or out of the '60s in this baby boom generation. All right, one of the things, well, there were many things about it, but one of the things is that it became apparent to the controllers at that time how the people are influenced by the music that they listen to. Because at that time, the Eve of Destruction was the number one song, or the Buffalo Springfield for What It's Worth, or Universal Soldier, these songs, see, and there was a certain, there was a, also a public reaction and response from the young people who listened to this kind of music. So great lengths have been gone to to seize control of the kind of music that people are going to hear. But because this is a democracy and a theoretically free society, you can't just you have to hide and disguise and lie about your censorships. So so your political censorships now become uh, they become hidden under business decisions, uh, 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 format creations. You know, and the people have decided for them what they will hear and what is popular rather than being a, given an, a real opportunity to make those decisions themselves. Personally, I think that people, there are more people that are willing to listen to spoken word and music and to listen to other music forms. All right, I, I just, I think that those people are there. But the way that it stands right now, uh, no one has come through with a big breakthrough and made it an in type of a thing, you know, where they have to deal with it. So you're not going to hear a lot of me on most commercial stations at this point, you know, because it hasn't happened yet, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but I, you know, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> These people, <laughs> that's how they behave. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Appreciate the call. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, boy, I'll just, yeah, well, I'll say it. I, I, I do this show a couple days a week, and I basically can say whatever I want. I've had a lot of freedom. I've had a lot of good fortune. And it's kind of sad what's happened to radio. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, the people in positions of talking on the air and playing the music, yeah, they could do basically what they want, bring the records from home. Now it's like, this is it. 
corporate decision. You play this. You go down the line. Yeah, it's you know totally taken mining the word you use mining the creative process from people that maybe do this because they love it, not necessarily what the money is about, yeah. just to play different types of music. So we'll take yeah. a few more calls, and I've got a couple other thoughts up my sleeve here. Uh, let's see here. Walter, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS. Hi, how are you, gentlemen? This We're evening? well. Thanks. Um, okay, I have a quick one for you. Um, there seems to be, uh, and I'm sorry, this isn't the question I initially left with Tammy, but it's very similar. It seems that the uh, fears of authority and of technological change and of the loss of uh, one's own cultural identity um, are, all, are all central to the theme here. And it seems that they perpetuate the idea that someone or something else is in control. Um, you seem to be advocating, like, taking on the personal responsibility to educate yourself and to know what's going on in your own world and to make the best effort to, uh, to do the right thing. That, that seems basically what you're saying. Um, any comments? No, that's basically what I'm saying. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. Um, it, it just seems like the, the, the repeating notion of fears, you know, of authority and technological change, um, I... Are those are, what, what, you think those are, well, you say know, that again? First, no, first I got the feeling like you were scared of technology and, and the next moment you embraced it, in a way, as long as it's used responsibly. Yeah, I'm afraid... No, I'm not afraid of technology. I don't right? get that at all. You know, um, no, I'm not afraid of technology. I think what maybe Walter heard was your clarification that, in a sense, technology can be used for good. Technology is a thing. It's like like the cup I drink my coffee out of right. is a thing. Right. Like an automobile is a thing. With, I mean, and, these, and, and both things are an extension of that thing, right? It's a thing. That's all that it is. It's what we as human beings, physical spirit, do with these things, right? And either we do responsible things with these things or we do irresponsible things with these things. In the end, that's what it comes down to, right? And about fear, you know, I have my fears, you know, and I know that, I, well, I have my fears, um, but if, if we're just going to look at the evolution of life, I don't fear that the technology is going to prevail over life. I don't fear that these dominator, male god, ruling class, exploitive, vampire, cannibalistic systems are going to prevail in the evolution. I don't fear that. I just know that we got to be as coherent as we can and continue the evolution of life and some sense of responsibility. You know, it's not about us being perfect. You know, we just do the best we can. I thank you for the call this morning. One question, and I don't want to, you know, have you chasing this one for 10 minutes because I want to be sensitive to your time. We've got some other callers here, but I have to ask this. It, it seems to me we are at a time right now in our evolution, if you will, where if we keep doing what we're doing, we as a human species, to our Earth Mother, that a whole new element of the ball game comes into play. That 20 years from now, 50 years from now, there's all this talk of possibly echo collapse. I mean, we're really, really doing a lot of damage. What's going to happen is depending upon how coherent and clear thinking we become now, this has every influence on the influence on on the future our coherency and our clarity now but we have to get rid of this arrogant notion that man even through his technology is going to destroy this planet it's not going to happen that's some of that male god dominator fantasy crap and that's exactly what that is all right man is going to maybe destroy technologic civilization's ability to live on this earth. Uh, evolution. It's like, let's look at the mutation of people. The tribes of, of Europe, all right, their mutant descendants are ingrained with fear 
ingrained. That's a part of the mutation of the tribes of Europe. All right? This, these fears and these insecurities, this lack of balance and purpose and sense of who they are and that, about power and energy, just, this whole, that's the mutation. See, so you can't avoid the mutation <laughs> because that's evolution. So whatever happens to the future, if, this systems, if the systems of technologic environment do collapse, it's because of our irrespons I mean, our irresponsible behavior has a part to do with it. It's not because of it, but yet it is in a way. Yeah. All right? Uh, but life will continue, and the human beings will continue on, but it may be, you know, there may be ten. <laughs> ten of them left. I mean, well, I'm just pulling a number out of nowhere, right? Because the earth has changed forms before. And, and, the, and I look at the earth as, as life, as a living life entity. So if technologic man must, uh, becomes, needs, if the earth needs to develop an antibiotic to eliminate technologic man because of its toxic behavior, then this, bio, this antibiotic will be created through the natural elements of earth, whether it's because, the, all right, because this man ate up the environment, the ozone, or poisoned its own water supply or whatever. But this is just that evolution and the earth taking care and, and and where to me it's what is central about it, it's the clarity and the coherency that we use now. That says what that ult will have an influence in what any ultimate evolutionary outcome. May I ask you one more question? Mm -hmm. it, it, it ties into something you said earlier and also something you just said. A, a, a lot of times over the years I hear this... These two words put together, human nature, okay? <laughs> it's human nature. I hear we have discussions on the air about war and brutalization of the spirit and uh, are we innately violent and, and we hear a lot of, well, human nature. Now, is human nature or whatever comes up in, in your estimation of what that is, is it naturally opportunistic or is it part of that virus that you talked it's about? It's part of that earlier? virus. It is part of that virus. Sure it is. You know? So, all right, let's say there is a human nature which addresses the physical realities and perceptions, but there's being nature too. Got it. <laughs> all right? Got it. See, so there's two natures. <laughs> all right? And it's the balancing of these things. See, we behave the way that we do and we have our perceptions of reality by those who define reality for us as we enter into their society structures. When we were still the tribes and, and, and of the tribal. See, we understood human nature and being nature. We understood that we have strengths and weaknesses. We understood this about us as human beings. So we created our ways of living to, to keep as much harmony as we possibly could with our understanding of reality. We created our societies to, to influence the strength and weakness so that they balanced out in a way that these were not exploitive societies. This, this whole technologic concept of human nature is about guilt, sin, and blame, right? It's about, it's about, uh, it's about a whole different perception. <laughs> and and um, so we have indoctrinated into us that we're bad, but we're conditioned by their definitions. You know, and, and uh, we can only... We will only we will only respond to this reality on the basis of the information that we are given, and if the basis of information that we are given is defined, if all of that information is defined by someone who is not looking out for our best interest, all right, then we will not live our lives in our best interest. Yeah, absolutely. Jeannie, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS. Good morning, Frank and John. It's very good to talk to you again. I, um, yeah, yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. <laughs> good. Um, a very good friend of uh, mine and a friend of uh, Frank's, who was a Native American activist, got murdered back in May. And when we had a ceremony for him, the thing that really brought it together was that we played the child's voice tape at this ceremony and it really moved people and you didn't mention this tape <laughs> when you were talking about your different um, CDs and tapes 
And the thing that I thought was so beautiful, that these were your daughters singing your words. And this touched everybody that was at the ceremony. There was a number of people from the Lakota tribe there who did a ceremony. And they didn't, weren't even aware that it was you and your, or your daughters doing the music, and they were just blown away by it. And I really wanted to thank you for having that music put on tape with your daughters. Um, it was very important. In fact, right when he was murdered that night, I went down to KPFK where I do programming for Roy Tuckman, and uh, we played Cliff's last talk and played um, questions off of a child's voice. And it was just like... It was the perfect thing. You were like Cliff's most favorite musician, singer, writer, singer, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Cliff appreciated it, too. I know he was there. And uh, I really wanted to thank you for it. Thank you. And talk, maybe talk about a little bit about that tape. All right. Uh, Charles Voice, Children yes. of Earth. Yes. Uh, it's a tape that uh, Mark Shark who is uh, one of my co-songwriters uh, with the, the electric music, and Quilt Man, who's my tribal voice man. Uh, they make the music for this, and I wrote these lyrics, these poems, these lines, uh, and, and my three daughters, uh, they, do the, they, they, they do the performance. Uh, call it singing, but they speak the lines like I do. I mean, they speak the lines. And, um, I think there's nine or ten or nine or eleven songs on the, on this album. And some of the songs are maybe would be just the vocals with maybe just a guitar in the background. And some of the songs are the vocals with the tribal drum. And some of the songs are the vocals with the guitar and the drum with Mark and Quill. And, Actually, um, and we recorded this maybe two years ago. So when the, the kids, the girls were about 11 and nine, eight, 10, 10 and 8 or something like that. Because it's a couple years ago that this was recorded. And we recorded it on, in an 8 track and just put it out the best that we can. We don't really have a distribution system for it. But generally, when I'm out with the band or music and we're doing shows, uh, we generally have it at our merchandising table. Right now, that's about the only way that it's out. Right. Well, um, See the Woman is one of my favorite songs on there. I wrote that. Yeah. A long time ago, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 1980. It really Five. hits the heart. <laughs> well, um, I'm so glad to hear you on here, and I hope that we can speak soon. Yes. And thank you, Frank, for having him on. Oh, my pleasure, Jeannie. Thank you. Take care. Uh -huh. yeah. Take care. We'll take a couple more and then maybe some closing thoughts or, I mean, hell man, I'm here at 4.30. You can <laughs> yeah, stay right, all night well, with me you, if you man. want. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Bill, good morning. You're on the air on KLOS. Good morning, Frank, and good morning. Good morning. Hello. John. Yeah. Good morning, sir. I'm, I, like Frank was saying, I, I too am very humbled. I listen to the program like uh, many people, and I, I'm very humbled. Uh, I, I can't wait to get a copy of your book. and. Um, the question that I wanted to state very briefly is that um, earlier in the program, as I was listening, unless I got the information wrong, uh, what you're all about is not so much promoting a Native American culture is perhaps enlightening uh, the world to the, maybe the Native American spirit. And also the other part of my question was is that I... Um, I've always been very uh, sort of spiritually attracted to the Native American and to the Indian way of life. Uh, the only uh, kind of problem that I've had, and maybe you could help me with this to understand maybe uh, that spirit better, is um, as I was trying to tell Tammy, was is that um, like in many cultures where there is um, spirit and religion, if you will, a way of life, um, how can one who has uh, not necessarily been acquainted with that way of life get um, I would say the the question would be is if if I wanted to really get in tune with let's say the um, the Native American spirit of what tribe have, are you brought up on and if I was very interested would you try to direct me towards the way 
you were brought up, or perhaps are there other Indian type cultures where the spirit may be easier to interpret, especially from people that are not uh, of that culture, like uh, people who are born here as maybe Native Americans, white, black, or of other type of color? Well, uh, <laughs> I really don't know how to answer this because um, it's like to me in a way, I don't know where, I mean, no, obviously there's no place I could send you to to do this because it's, it's I don't know, it's kind of a little bit out of my grasp because it's like we have to, to me it's like recognizing that we have, we are spirit ourselves and we have it and it's how we, you know how we would pray i mean we can do that <laughs> you know uh we don't need any ceremony we need nothing we have consciousness um but i i it's difficult for me to tell people to go to this different tribal group of people or this different tribal group of people because they will show them about spirituality because I don't know, you know, I, I I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I have my perceptions of reality, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, and I know I have a spirit, <laughs> you know, but I'm, I can't offer anyone any spiritual guidance, you know, whether it's uh, as a spiritual counselor or sending them spiritual guidance in the sense of sending them to spiritual counselors. Yeah, all I know about it is I have one, and I know that I do, you know, and and I know a lot of other people that do. Uh, and but what rather than be sent anywhere, as my feeling is, find your way there, <laughs> you know, find your way there. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate the call, John. Let me ask you this: when I heard you just trying to convey your thoughts and feelings to Bill, the word elder hit me. The way, uh, I mean, you look at the West and the way we treat our older people. No, re in my experience, no respect, no understanding, uh, no, no connection. No connection, exactly. Um, it's not how you treat them; it's how they're mistreated. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's just a detachment, been disconnected. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that. See, if well, to me, if we're talking about spirit, it's like I, I guess in a way it, you know, it's about recognition of ourselves, acceptance of ourselves, you know, uh, how clear and coherent we can be within ourselves. See, I think this has all got to do with these spiritual realities. Um, and one of the words, respect, you know, respect, show some respect, <laughs> mm. you know, and I think if, if, uh, if we would devote as much time as we can to showing respect. I'm not talking about being ex goofy or extreme or excessive. I'm just talking about just pure basic respect, you know. Because sometimes people can get carried away, but just respect simply. What are the other areas I just want to touch on, and, and then I'm going to bid you do. I yes. get a sense that we're getting close to that time. Uh, the word pride, proud, that's something that... <laughs> We we've got pretty much uh, ingrained in us like it's it's something to uh, I don't know to in in your book one of your talks if I'm not mistaken you drew the analogy between pride and being grateful if I'm not mistaken yeah pride human being let's go back to the human being now the nature human nature and the nature of being right. Uh, See, I, I, I like to me. There's a difference between a spiritual way of life and a religious way of life. I think that religion is what. I think that religion is what is used to oppress the spirit. 
Yes, I don't, I don't think that they are, they are of the two. They have two different complete meanings. Religion is about domination. Spirit, spirituality is about responsibility. Uh, so now let's look at pride. Pride has a religious, I mean, it's very religious. People are religious about their pride. Very, very much smacks of religion and indoctrinated with these religion, submission, domination trips. Uh, so when I look at pride, uh, it's more of the human. And yet I look at, well, there's also humility, which is more of the being. See, so I, I can't quite figure out pride, but I don't think that pride is something one should use in relationship to the self other than let's maybe being proud of, an, of seeing someone do good, right? But, but proud and I am, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't think so because it's, it, it's, it's, it's about, it's not about humility. I mean, we can say, like, and, and we can say, well, I'm grateful, I'm thankful. Expression of the being, expression of being. All right? Proud, I am proud, expression of human. <laughs> All right? The logic. Grateful, thankful of the heart. See, and there is, the humility is gone and the respect is going. Because the pride, and the pride eats everybody up. They crave it, but it eats them all up. I mean, how many people... I mean, if we deal with reality, how many times within our own individual lives have we seen pride wreak havoc? Whether it, you know... Uh, uh, history is littered with the havoc. All right? It's, it's like every war that was ever fought. They were proud of their king or their god, or, and their god or their king was proud of them. You know, every, every, look in this country, look at the hypocrisy that this country represents. And people are proud. See, and I think if they would stop being so proud and, and understand, you know, <laughs> about other things, see, then maybe, maybe they could have a better life. <laughs> you know, instead of having to put up with the, with the insecurities. Right? I mean, you know, and we get right down to it because, you know, uh, because people have to face a certain reality, especially within our generation. We got no health services. Majority of us got nobody to take care of us when we get old. <laughs> right? Majority of us are going to watch our children have to work to pay off debts that were accumulated by those who feed off us. There are and a significant number amongst our generation don't even have a clue you know, that they're, got, that they're going to have a job a year from now or two years from now or three years from now. Let alone they're going to have a place to live. You know, and everybody's so busy being proud of their democracy and their so-called principles, all right, that, that nothing, <laughs> that's all they've got. They don't have a quality of life that really speaks to, addresses any kind of tranquility. You know, and a great, and, you know, and there are different segments of the society that can put on these, paint these different masks of pride upon their image, so that no one really sees what's going on. But if you look at the collective behavior of the society at large, it's very obvious what's going on. These are a proud people, but they got no self-respect. <laughs> you know, and I don't mean to be trashing America. Now, it's not my intention to offend anyone. But you know, but the reality is, is, you know. A lot of lying going on about who's a good guy around, you know, what represents good and bad in this society. And people, you know, it's like in, in, in when, 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 the, when the, uh, the Reich was identified as German and Nazi and all this and that, you know, when it rose there, it, it had to do, it had everything in the world to do. With doing it, I mean, it did what it did. But so anyway, I don't know what that has to do with what you first asked me about pride. But but proud people better watch out. <laughs> That's what'll eat them up. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, man, it was uh, 
I, I'm, I'm really blessed that you came down tonight and shared some of your time and energy. And uh, uh, I, I, I just, you know, uh, uh, I'm grateful. I, I really am. And, and one of the customs or rituals that we have on this program, as long as I've been here, is I always give my guest an opportunity in closing to say anything they'd like or share anything that comes up. And tagged with that is to accept my thanks for being here. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that... Actually, I'm glad that I came here. I don't know what to tell anybody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> think clearly. Seek coherency. Seek coherency. <laughs> you know? Make peace with the earth. Not, it's not about peace on earth. Make peace with the earth. Because in line with something that was said earlier, you know, we're wearing rubber shoes, we're wearing a lot of stuff. Right? But that does, But... We don't have to become disconnected from the earth if we use our minds to not do that. And if we just remember that, you know, there may come a time, I think there is, the time is here now, but maybe our, our, our real responsibility is to protect this planet and life. And that may be, and there may be a time when we really understand that, when we understand that, and our power will start to come back to us. But be careful of the illusion, and don't trust Bill. <laughs> thank you, John. Yes, thank you. We're going to segue out of this to the open phone segment with uh, my favorite, my favorite song or words uh, from Tribal Voice. This is "Living in Reality" and John Trudell on KLOS. The children laugh, the old ones laugh. The newborn cry, the elders weep. The knowledge of infants and elders, separated only by years. Adulthood lost to growing up fear, the only security being insecurity. Changing crying to weeping. The wisdom of infants and elders, crying and laughing, weeping and laughing. Songs in the beginning, sung in the end. Endure, the people cry out. Tears of anger, tears of sorrow, flowing, giving birth to resistance. Young ones to remember. Struggle, for the people cry out. Tears of happiness, tears of joy. Washing the pain, cleaning the spirit, giving strength. The generations remembering the past to rebuild the future. For weeping is another way of laughing and resisting and outlasting the enemy. Living in reality, calling us red Indians, we have been the colors on a chameleon's back, changing with time, altering the larger pattern, surviving genocide because we have to. Living in reality, we are targets of your unfairness. With warriors for targets, you create your own destruction. This is how we bring you down target by target. You wound yourself. Using your greed, we watch your spirit fade. Living in reality, we can endure your cages, your bullets, your lies, your confusion. We know you have destroyed your peace. Living in reality, you only exist. Diablo Canyon, today I challenge the nukes. The soldiers of the state placed me in captivity, or so they thought. They bound my wrist in their plastic handcuffs, surrounding me with their plastic minds and faces. They ridiculed me, but I could see through to the ridicule they brought on themselves. They told me, squat over there by the trash. They left a soldier to guard me. I was the Viet Cong. I was Crazy Horse. Little did they understand. Squatting down in the earth, they placed me with my power my power to laugh, laugh at their righteous wrong. Their sneers and their taunts gave me clarity to see their powerlessness. It was in the way they dressed and in the way they acted. They viewed me as an enemy, a threat to their rationalizations. I felt pity for them knowing they will never be free. I was their captain, but my heart was racing through the generations, the memories of eternity. I was beyond their reach. 
I would be brought to the internment camp to share my time with allies. The last time I saw them, they were standing in their 12-hour shifts, addicted to their chain of command, waiting to be told what to do, forgetting about me, thinking I was just another protester they were finished with. Never understanding, I am not finished with them, for I am the resistance, and as always, I will return. It took the times we didn't care about living to learn survivors survive whether they want or not. It took the pain, the grief, and the dying to remember what gets forgotten in the living. It took the lessons of a thousand generations to get through the time of yesterday. It took the joyful songs of laughter to last beyond today into tomorrow. It took the fragrance of a woman's touch to realize brothers and sisters are never alone. It took the joining of earth and sky to create, centering the universe. For Ronald America, this time I almost wanted to believe you when you said it would be all right. You wanted to end the suffering, and the deliberateness of the wrongs were only in my imagination. This time I almost wanted to believe you when you implied the times of sorrow were buried in the past. Never would we have to worry about shadows and memories clinging and draining the strength from our souls. This time I almost wanted to believe you when you spoke of peace and love and caring and duty and God and destiny. But somehow the death in your eyes and your bombs and your taxes and your greed and your facelift told me, this time I cannot afford to believe you. Industrial slave, Industrial slave, capitalist and communist imperialist, smiling with false faces, beckoning us with their lies about progress, wanting us to enjoy the rape of earth and our minds. Industrial slave, forked tongue legalistic contract chains, turning our visions to technologic nightmares. National security war makers desecrating the natural world, and God still trying to get over what you've done to his boy. Industrial slave, Material bound, law and order, religious salvation, individually alone, industrial slave. Without earth there is no heaven, streets of gold, angels' wings, eternal life, corporate Reich nuclear regimes maximizing profit, eating identities, plundering natural allies as though earth is dead, allowing religious right collection plate tributes to church and state, with Christ still hanging from a cross, echoing industrial war cries, warring against body and soul, attacking spirit, lying to enslave with an illusion about freedom. Without earth, there is no heaven. Earth and sky, universal power, life energies, creative flow, in which we are a pattern to keep balance, harmony, a gift, and appreciation to enjoy. Honor life. Without earth, there is no heaven. 